It was a war nearly everyone thought would be over in a matter of weeks. No one, especially in the South, was prepared for the number of soldier and civilian casualties. By modern estimates, nearly 900,000. Suddenly it becomes this very real thing with this huge proportion of Americans dying. How do you deal with loss is a central question at the end of the Civil War and a question that's particularly difficult for Southerners. Not only have they lost this entire generation of men, they've also lost what they believed was a way of life. This was a very difficult thing for Southerners to come to terms with. They had sacrificed so much and had fought so hard and had prayed with such fervor for victory and they didn't get it. The war violated many conventions held dear by people in the 19th century. One was the idea of the good death, death at home in one's own bed. You died surrounded by loved ones. You knew that you would be taken care of, you would be buried properly. A war turns all that on its head. You die far away from your family. You die among strangers. Most men who died in the Civil War were buried in unmarked graves. They were thrown into trenches. They were thrown into pits. They were thrown into wells. Most of those bodies would not be returned home. They began to ask the really big questions. Was it worth it? What did we fight for? How are we going to remember what went on? And in trying to get a grip on those, the South develops what's called the lost cause, which was an ideal, if you will, of what the war had been and why they had fought. It's a way to come to terms with what happened. If God is on our side, how could we have lost? If we were right, how could we have lost? In 1866, Virginia newspaperman Edward Pollard published The Lost Cause, a new Southern history of the War of the Confederates. It was the beginning of a series of histories told from a Southern perspective. A new mythology was taking shape in the South. According to The Lost Cause, that the South only lost, not because she wasn't brave, the South lost because she was outmanned and outgunned. And because the North fought dirty, the idea is that Sherman and all of those people used dirty tactics. The South was gentlemanly, almost too good to win. The South really had no chance to win the Civil War, that it was simply fought for honor's sake. Everyone was noble and everyone was fighting for the right reasons, for a good reason, that it was right to secede. The South had never been in the wrong, according to Lost Cause adherents. The South had always been just doing the right thing and, and had a constitutional right to secede. This war, they said, was about states' rights and constitutional issues and nothing else. Well, what about slavery? According to the Lost Cause, slavery was a generous, benign institution. Slaves liked being slaves. It was good for them. They were good and faithful servants who didn't really want their freedom. Southerners defending the lost cause argued that the war was about states' rights, that it was indeed not about slavery. Confederate leaders never said that <laughs> during the war. It was pretty clear from people like Jefferson Davis on down to the lowest Confederate, Johnny Reb, what was at stake if the Confederacy were to lose its bid for independence, the destruction of the slave system. All one has to do is go back and look at the primary documents that were written before the war, to read the South Carolina Ordinance of Secession, to read the Charleston Mercury and other Southern newspapers that make it very clear that the great fear was that slavery would be eradicated. And slavery was very essential, a driving motivation of the Civil War. And slavery was not a benign institution. It was an institution that went against the ideals America claimed to believe in. But Southerners are not perhaps ready to accept this in the 1800s. Soon the lost cause becomes more than any sort of an academic debate. It becomes flesh and bone for Southerners. Southerners continue to mourn their dead. And women are very key to this because the sewing circles, the thimble brigades, became the Ladies' Memorial Associations and later the United Daughters of the Confederacy. They brought Southern bodies home. They built cemeteries and they placed markers. 
By 15 years after the war, the monuments were no longer monuments about death and sadness. They were monuments celebrating military valor, celebrating the soldier, celebrating the fighting spirit. The idea was not to celebrate the generals, but to celebrate the common man. Confederate veterans reunions lended credence to this, the idea that all old soldiers were good soldiers. And all of these markers being put up by the daughters and the granddaughters of these old men, it went on from the late 1870s all the way to the 1920s. During this time, even academic historians were swayed by the romantic ideal of the Old South. If it had lost the war in one way, it was winning the war in another. It was winning the war in terms of memory. The United Daughters of the Confederacy and other civic groups that supported the lost cause were often the groups that approved textbooks for Southern schools. If a textbook didn't meet their standards, they would object to it in school board meetings. And so these textbooks went on for generation after generation in Southern schools, relatively unchallenged. In 1915, D.W. Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation, reinforced lost cause values even as it celebrated the beginnings of the Ku Klux Klan. In the late 1930s, a best-selling book and a blockbuster film once again romanticized the Southern experience. Many people get their Civil War history from Gone with the Wind, which told a very Southern, very lost cause tale. By mid-20th century, most historians had become critical of the lost cause school, now being challenged by the civil rights movement. Just as civil rights blossoms, we also see many Southerners turning to the old images of the Civil War as a sign of defiance, raising the battle flags, for example. It wasn't really until 1990 in Ken Burns's documentary, The Civil War, that a very big public discussion began about what did the war mean? What did it mean for different groups of people? And what did it mean for America as a nation? And that Southerners should perhaps reconsider the lost cause. This is something that probably has held the South back in many ways, especially in improving race relations. We ignore the lessons of that war at our own peril as a people, both Northerners and Southerners, because the issues are still with us and, and will be for a long, long time. We are a band of brothers and native to the soil. We're fighting for our liberty with treasure, blood, and toil. And when our rights were threatened, the cry rose near and far. Hurrah for the bonny blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah for southern rights. Hurrah, hurrah for the bonny blue flag that bears a single star. As long as the Union was faithful to her trust, like friends and like brethren, a kind were we and just. But now when northern treachery attempts our rights to mar, we hoist on high the bonny blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah for southern rights. Hurrah, hurrah for the bonny blue flag that bears a single star. First gallant South Carolina nobly made her stand. Then came Alabama, who took her by the hand. Next quickly Mississippi, Georgia and Florida. Oh, raised on high the bonny blue flag that bears a single star. Hurrah, hurrah.